Hey everyone and welcome to my birthday because yes, this year the Linux and open source news and my birthday happen on the same day, which is nice. So this week we've got the Steam Controller 2's design leaking and if, like me, you're a fan of asymmetrical sticks, you're not gonna like this specific design. We also have Wayland drivers finally landing in wine, meaning Proton will be able to work better on Wayland, and it also means you'll get better performance on Wayland than on X11, so that's pretty cool. And we also have the logical conclusion to the Bcash FS saga, where the developer and his contributions were blocked for this release cycle, because, well, you know why. So let's talk about this, but first let's talk about our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Proton VPN. You probably already know about Proton. They offer an end-to-end -end encrypted suite of online tools that are focused on privacy and on security. What you do or what you store in there is yours and cannot be accessed even by Proton employees. Proton VPN is one of the best out there. It is fully open source, it doesn't log anything you do, and it has independent audits to prove it. It comes with an ad blocker and a malware blocker, and it implements VPN accelerators that other VPNs simply do not have, so you can have better browsing speeds. It's also based in Switzerland, and as such, isn't subject to US or EU jurisdiction. And currently they have 70% off their VPN Plus plan at $2.99 per month for a 24-month subscription, giving you access to the VPN on up to 10 devices with all the protections, the use of a custom DNS, all of their 8,600 servers located in more than 110 countries, and the highest speeds possible. So click the link in the description to give Proton VPN and Proton in general a good shot while the deal still lasts. Now, do you remember the Steam Controller 2 rumors? Well, it looks like the actual design has leaked now. And I cannot say I really enjoyed what I saw there. This design has been spotted on Steam DB, where they basically data mine everything they can for every nugget of information. But for the controller codenamed Ibex, which is the Steam Controller 2, it seems to look like a flattened Xbox controller with shorter side grips, symmetrical sticks in the middle, and two giant touchpads located underneath and outwards of the sticks. There's also, of course, a D-pad up top, the usual A, B, X, Y buttons, also on the top right, and two main buttons in between the touchpads at the bottom of the pad, and two other small buttons located above the sticks, plus the usual bumpers and triggers. The render really doesn't let you know how thick or thin this controller is, or how big it is, but already I can identify a few potential issues. First, symmetrical sticks are in my opinion, some people might disagree, worse than asymmetrical sticks. They force both your thumbs in extended positions where you engage your muscles. On the PlayStation controller, it is not too bad because the controller's design makes you rotate your wrists to hold it, so your thumbs rest half naturally on the sticks placed at the bottom, but on the old Wii U gamepad, for example, it was atrocious. You have to always have muscles engaged to keep your thumbs on the sticks. It resulted in wrist strain for me after 30 minutes. On the PlayStation controllers, symmetrical sticks also tend to have my thumbs bump into one another as the sticks are located too close. On the Steam Deck, that's not an issue because your hands are very far apart and the device offers a very large grip that is basically straight up then down, meaning that your wrists aren't rotated and your thumbs just land normally on these two sticks. But on the Steam controller, these two symmetrical sticks are straight in the middle of the controller, close to one another, so there's potential for both sticks and thumbs touching each other, making you lose track of what you're trying to do, and this position will force you to have your muscles engaged, unless they really have uh, grips that are angled at a large angle, which it doesn't look like they have on that design. And of course, this is just dumb analysis done from one image shown at an angle, so obviously until we actually have this controller in hand and we can try it, see how big it is, how angled the grips are, how you hold it, we won't know. I trust Valve to have the ergonomics 
down to a T because the Steam Deck is a really, really nice thing to hold, even though it's really big and pretty heavy. It never really hurt my arms or my thumbs or my wrists while playing, which is not the case with a Nintendo Switch or a PS4 or PS5 controllers, which are a nightmare to use for me. Uh, for me, the gold standard is this, the Xbox One or Xbox Series controller. This is just the most comfortable gamepad I have ever used ever. And I hoped the Steam controller would take inspiration from this. Apparently, they didn't. Now let's talk about the Bcash FS situation again. We talked about it at length already. Well, the code of conduct will fortunately be applied, meaning that all pull requests from the developer Kent Overstreet will be declined during this development cycle. He will be able to resume contributions for the 6.14 development cycle if he so wishes. Of course, Overstreet answered this ruling saying that he apologized for things getting heated but obviously he still could not accept things as they are and he tried to justify his behavior saying that like other major kernel developers like Linus Torvalds they only really shout when there's a good reason so you should really listen to them when they start shouting so yeah the guy is basically comparing themselves to Torvalds like the creator of the Linux kernel and the head of the entire project. He also said that the maintainers side of the kernel lacks strong technical leadership and that the most intelligent people are those that know how to recognize good ideas and integrate them without debating them. Once again, I assume propping up his own way of coding as the right one or at least being misunderstood in how good his ideas are. And I mean, I will give this guy that. These sorts of projects like the kernel really need sort of imaginary unicorn people that are not only really good at social skills and communicating and working with others and trusting them and also being very skilled at coding and reading code and also being accepting of solutions that they didn't create and also being able to recognize excellent technical solutions that create risk but taking those risks but not taking too much risk basically these people do not exist in any project if you had a venn diagram of all of this it would look like a bunch of floating circles that simply do not touch each other now something that i missed last week wine 9.22 was released and usually these aren't too major but this one is pretty interesting because the wayland driver for wine is now enabled in the default wine configuration which is very nice because it means it will also be the default, well, at least enabled by default, in Wine 10, the next stable version of Wine that should release in January. And Proton, the thing made by Valve based on Wine to play games through Steam, this thing tends to only base itself on the stable Wine versions. So it means Proton will have a native Wayland driver next year. And this is important because it means everyone using Wayland to play games will no longer need X Wayland and all the overhead that X11 brings. They will be able to play games natively on Wayland, which not only will save a bit of RAM and performance, but also might perform better because Wayland is just a much better optimized system than X11 ever was. Now, Wine 9.22 also brings display mode virtualization. It brings direct play support as well, this being the old networking API that has been a focus for the best part of the quarter uh, in Wine as a development focus. There are also bug fixes for Dark Souls Remastered, World of Warcraft and the Steam Windows client. Now obviously that Wayland driver for Wine will not be fully baked in, fully ready. I don't expect it to perform at 100% peak efficiency, but it being stable and being there means it can be used in Proton, it can be tested, and fixes can be pushed to it as time goes on, which is probably better for everyone because, well, that's still a limiting factor for people who want to game on Linux. Now this week we also had the release of Elementary OS 8, the brand new major version of this distribution that, if you didn't know, kickstarted this channel because that's the first thing I started talking about, uh, what was it, seven years ago, I think. So Elementary OS 8 is now based on Ubuntu 24.04 LTS, so it has a newer kernel, newer drivers, a newer base, and newer things in the repos, even though it doesn't care about the repos because by default, you only have access to Flatpak 
applications that you can install graphically. Obviously, the command line works for the rest, but they now ship with Flatpak apps only and Flathub by default, which is a really nice improvement compared to the previous version where for some reason they decided they did not want to pre-ship Flatpak, meaning that their app store was completely barren. That's no longer the case, and that's a very good move. Elementary OS 8 also brings a new Wayland session. It is not the default. They still default to X11. Uh, they call the new Wayland session the secure session and the X11 one the classic session. And their secure session works basically as well as the X11 one, but it's probably not as well tested and that's likely why they didn't put it by default. Uh, but it does bring a bunch of new portals. They also now support uh, Flatpak permissions in their uh, system settings. They have a lot of accessibility features and improvements, but most likely only for X11 uh, because, well, Wayland and accessibility don't necessarily play well all the time. They also rewrote their their entire dock. It looks and feels exactly the same as the previous one, but it does have a few cool features like pressing super plus a number to open an application, uh, automatically spreading the windows of an app that has multiple windows open. You can middle click an app icon to open a new window and things like that. It's definitely a good improvement over what was in elementary OS 7. You also now have quick settings in the top panel with a bunch of accessibility features and links to uh, log out, to shut down, to restart. You have offline updates for the system, which are handled in the system settings. And you, of course, have all the updates to your flat packs handled through the App Center. This App Center has a better links and, uh, and information about the various applications that you're browsing. And there are a bunch of small tweaks here and there, notably uh, making the keyboard shortcuts more sensible and more in line with what everyone else is doing. I think Elementor OS still has a future, still has potential, but right now they're just playing catch up version after version and the gap is widening. So hopefully now that the Wayland transition and the GTK4 transition are complete or at least complete enough that they can start focusing on other things, hopefully they're gonna bring some new features and maybe regain some of the lost ground compared to stuff like GNOME. And speaking of desktops, Cinnamon, the desktop environment for Linux Mint, got a new update yesterday, version 6.4. Now, as always with Cinnamon, it is minor changes. Uh, point updates to Cinnamon are much smaller than point updates to GNOME or KDE, obviously. Uh, but this version brings nightlight support in the display settings. It's a new tool that supports both X11 and and Wayland compared to, I think, Redshift was the one they used before, which only worked on X11 and relied on an API that was completely deprecated. So this thing is now integrated straight in the desktop settings instead of being a separate utility. The default theme of the Cinnamon desktop also got tweaked. That's not the theme that Linux Mint uses. That's the theme that other distros that ship Cinnamon will use by default. That theme was improved to get a little bit darker, to have better contrast. Uh, it also has better modal dialogues with colored buttons. It has rounded corners. It supports panel highlights. It better handles icons in the panels with separation and padding. Basically, distros that do not use the mint theme but still use cinnamon will look a lot better when using that desktop. The on-screen display elements also should look a lot better now. Notifications and animations were much improved. The power module now has power profiles through the freedesktop.org standard using Dbus, and there are a lot of other smaller changes here and there. So Mint users, who are the vast majority of Cinnamon users, will get access to this new version in Mint 22.1, which should release before the end of the year, so next month in December, they tend to really enjoy uh, putting out a new version of Linux Mint like on the 20th or 22nd of December, which is always very nice when you're trying to review something, having to work in that specific week. Thank you very much, Linux Mint developers, uh, but also thank you for your work, so I guess that's good. Now, Linux Mint users will probably not really care all that much about this change because it's mostly changes to a theme that they will not use, but for other distros, it's definitely a solid update that they will want to ship. And to conclude on today's episode, the Steam Deck has now passed 17,000 games marked as playable and as verified. This includes 
5,678 verified titles, so games that will absolutely play fine on the Steam Deck uh, with good performance, with text that is readable, with good controller support. There's also 11,323 playable titles, so games that will run fine on the deck, but they probably have a launcher that doesn't display really well, or text that is a bit too small, or some controller inputs not mapped out properly or maybe their default configuration is not good enough for the deck and you have to lower the settings manually. There are also 4,400 games marked as unsupported, which again doesn't mean that they're completely unplayable on any Linux computer, just that they're not playable on the Steam Deck in good conditions. Now, new verified titles include Horizon Zero Dawn Remastered, a game that really has zero reason to exist because the original one already looks fantastic, was released really early, and the only reason to remaster it is to sell a PS5 Pro. Uh, there's Planet Coaster 2, there's also Sonic X Shadow Generations, which I have no idea what this game is about, but why is Sonic still in video games? And there are a few others as well. Now, if anyone still doubted it, the Steam Deck is the console with the biggest number of games available out there, maybe of all time, even including emulation and backwards compatibility. I don't think there's any console, handheld or not, that has access to as many games as the Steam Deck. And yes, it is a console, it's a device sold with an OS made to run games with a controller attached to it. The fact that you can boot it into a desktop mode is a bonus that Valve incidentally added. It is not the main design point. It's not a PC, it's a console, and it's probably the console with the most games ever, which is really, really nice. Every month widens that gap even more. It doesn't mean that it's a perfect gaming device. It does struggle with recent titles. It doesn't play a bunch of games that people really want to play because of anti-cheat, but it is still a fantastic offering for the price. It has just more games available than any other device on the current market or that was ever sold. So congrats uh, to Valve for this. I don't know how many Steam Decks they still sell. I really hope that they do a Steam Deck 2 or a Steam Home Console next year to have that AAA experience, that AAA hardware uh, that developers can target. But in the meantime, the deck is actually pretty cool. And since the Steam Deck is more console than PC, if you're looking for a PC, then you have today's sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box. I talk about them all the time on the YouTube channel. They've been a sponsor of my channel for something like three years now, and they're really awesome. I only use their computers these days to run my YouTube channel, to run all my podcasts, all the benefits I give to Patreon members and uh, YouTube members, all my teaching job, everything is done on one of their laptops, and all my gaming needs are served by one of their desktops, the Tuxedo Cube. They have a big, big choice of devices with plenty of options, and you will find something that works for you in there. So as always, the link is in the description. Click that to learn more about Tuxedo. Okay, so thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, you know what to do. There are all those nice little buttons underneath the video. Click those to make the video pop in the algorithm and everyone will be happy, myself included. If you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of links to support it down in the video description. And in the meantime, thank you all for watching and I guess you will see me in the next one next week. Bye.